Uh, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's excellent to be here. Um, and it's been, I've been in South Africa now for three days, and it's just been incredible. So I'm very happy that I get to show you a little bit of my work. Um, and I'll start you off with... Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you know, if you're going to have a montage, you might as well go for it. Um, so what you saw there is kind of a, a broad spectrum uh, overview of what I do. And I'll tell you a little bit, though, about why I do that kind of stuff um, by giving you a little glimpse into my brain. Um, no, your operating system, in other words. Um, all that you just saw and all that you're going to see in the next 45 minutes is basically my way of coping with the way my brain steers me. Uh, and initially, you kind of think, oh, yeah, the brain, you know, it's fun, it's, um, it's helpful, it's going to sort of let you do the things you want to do. And it pretends to be really supportive. So, you know. But then the problem is you start thinking and you think, oh, hey, great, the brain is giving me ideas. This is excellent. I'm going to go with this. I'm going to run with it. And next thing you know, it starts turning and it starts getting a little nastier. Um, and the doubts start creeping in. Um, and from there, it's only a very, very short step uh, to where I usually end up, which is kind of like this. Um. <laughs> so what happens is my brain is not a team player. My brain pretends to be a team player, but then immediately will sort of sell me out and will just come at me with self-doubt. And so then it becomes, you know, it gets to be sort of a very dark thing because when, you know, for all of us, I'm, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this, um, you, you live, whether you work alone as I do or you're working in a company, if you're engaged in the creative pursuit, eventually it all comes down to being alone with your own head and hoping for, you know, for that sort of little nugget of gold that you can put out on the page or you know, even just a little sort of you know, bouillon of pewter to get you through the day. Um, <laughs> and at that point, you have to find a way of working around your brain because otherwise your brain is going to mess you up because your brain is sort of like an unruly pit bull. Uh, and it'll chew up the furniture at best. Um, so what I do with that is um, that I come up with workarounds. And one of the, f the first sort of immediate workaround is, of course, that I take on clients. And I put my obsessive-compulsive disorder in the service of others. 
because at that point, you know, I can say, brain, look over here, work on this now. Um, you know, I know I've eaten too much, but just, just work on this type now. Um, and I'll show you some of that work. Um, the first of which being uh, one of my longest running clients is a gallery in Venice, California called L.A. Louver, uh, who let me do things like this, which is a catalog that I did for David Hockney uh, in a show of his landscape paintings. And that's just incredibly soothing work to do, you know, because it's not my own art that I'm dealing with. I don't have to come up with anything. All it is is I get these gorgeous, ravishing paintings, and all I have to do is find a good system to display that stuff that's logical, that maybe has a few little fun bits to it. Um, you know, it suits very much the German soul. Um, <laughs> You know, it's sort of, it's, it's kind of modernist autopilot. Flush, flush left just is like a warm bath. <laughs> um, I'll show you a few more pages. Uh, you know, all the lines in that particular catalog, uh, the little credit lines. Hang on, I have a laser pointer, I'll show you. Um, all the credit lines in the catalog line up with the horizons in the paintings. You know, stuff like that, Prussian things. Wait, hang on, hang on. Did one lone person applaud the horizon line? I, thank you, I like it. No, no, I like whoever that person is, you're one of, you, we're gonna get along, it's great. Um, and, you know, and then there's retouching to be done, and retouching is even better. I mean, retouching, you really don't have to think. You just go, ah, oh, cloning. <laughs> I, could, I could clone for hours on end, and it's just, <sighs> It's like, it's meditation. On that particular one, I did actually take out all the walls, uh, the ceiling, the floor is partially retouched because I wanted the red in the gallery to be completely consistent throughout all the pages, and we had to shoot throughout the day so the light changed. So I just took the walls out, put them back in, put the fake spotlights in and everything. You know, things like that. So that really, as I said, that really calms the brain. Um, and then you finish it off with a little bit more flush left, a little grid system for the thank you notes, and you're in good shape. You know, you've made it through another day, and, you know, everybody lives. So that's good. <laughs> another job in that vein that came in was uh, from the uh, Indian director Tarsem, who some of you may know from his film with Jennifer Lopez and, um, uh, called, and Vincent D'Onofrio called The Cell. He then did an independent movie two or three years ago called The Fall, and as he was working on that, he came to me. He, wanted to sh he didn't have a final cut, and he was financing this all independently, and he said, I need something that I can show to possible distributors uh, without actually revealing, without sort of uh, showing my hand on the cut of the film. So he just dropped off uh, 7,000 photos and said, edit that into a book, which, of course, I did. Um, and I don't know if any of you have seen the movie. Uh, this is a little girl, Alexandra, who is the, the heroine of the movie, uh, whose dream we see. Uh, and uh, the book kept getting bigger and bigger because uh, every time I showed a comp, Tarsem saw, had seen a book by another director that was physically bigger. And he said, well, it has to be at least bigger than this book. And so ultimately ended up being 14 by 17, and there was a little sort of acrylic dust sleeve that came off so that she would wear a mask as she does in the movie, and then when you reveal the book, the mask comes off. You know, clever things. Um, here are a few spreads from the book. The whole story is that basically the little girl uh, has an, uh, an orange-picking accident in a 1920s Los Angeles orchard, um, like you do, and um, <laughs> gets, goes to the hospital and meets Roy, the silent movie stuntman, who tried to kill himself because his girlfriend, the leading lady of the movie, uh, dumped him for the, for the leading actor, and so he wants to kill himself, and it didn't work, so he's in the hospital now. He killed his horse, though, so, you know, partial success. And, um, and he, t he starts telling Ale Alexandria the story so that she will bring him, that she likes him, and she will bring him enough morphine, scene top left, uh, so that he can finish the job and kill himself. You know, a happy family movie with also incredible locations, uh, and Tarsem shot this all over the world. He shot it in Fiji, he shot it in, uh, in India, he shot some of it here in South Africa, actually, and now I understand why. Um, 
The banner there on the left is when the masked bandit, Roy's alter ego, uh, loses his brother to the evil governor, Odious, and so he buries him in the desert, and as he lays him to rest on this banner, the banner soaks with his brother's blood. Again, you know, light fare. Um, good for airplanes, really. Um, this right here uh, is, as you can see clearly at the bottom, is Charles Darwin after his monkey was shot. Um, that was also about uh, 28 hours of delicious, delicious retouching to take out a fence on one of those walkways and then make the walkway the same width as the other ones because it is physically twice as wide. Um, hang on, we have the laser pointer, I'll show you. This walkway right here is twice as wide and has a big six-foot fence. And taking out a fence, usually not that complicated, except for the motion blur, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> And if you're going to get married, why not like that? Um, if you're going to take that leap, I say commit to a dress. Uh, the costumes are done by Eiko Ishioka, who also did Bram Stoker's Dracula. She did uh, Miles Davis cover in the 70s. Very, very cool person. And this was always my favorite shot, the one on the right there. And Eiko actually had approval on what got to go into the book because they're her costumes. And Eiko said, well, that shot has to go. And I said, why? And, you know, all this goes through intermediaries. So Eiko talks to Tarsem, Tarsem talks to his manager, and his manager talks to me. And they said, well, it, don't, don't ask questions, just make it go away. And I said, no, it's good, though. And I knew from my record industry days to sort of look a little closer and go, okay, what could somebody possibly find wrong with this? Um, and what it was is that during the shoot in India, the set dresser or the costume wrangler um, hadn't ironed the sleeves properly, and there was also a wrinkled train back here, so I just took the wrinkles out and took the train off. If any of you have bad photos, just call me. I can help. <laughs> um, uh, another thing that happened is that, of course, we needed to have some sort of title or some sort of logo type for the book. And, of course, my, my sort of my secret desire was that I wanted to do the opening credits for the movie, which Tarsem wanted no part of. He was like, no, 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 we have professionals that do that sort of thing. I'm like, what? I am not a professional? Um, evidently not. Evidently, I'm a professional for static, but not a professional for motion. So... Um, Okay, so I was like, fine. It's my book, though, so I'm going to pitch this logo to you. And Tarsem has something where, that he calls type blindness, where he will read the information, but he won't notice fonts or any of that. And so he looked at that, and he was like, I don't know, and hmm, and it's big, and I don't know. And the whole thing is a movie about a movie, and couldn't it be like, you know, like a movie script, so couldn't we make it be, I don't know, like a typewriter font? And I said, ah, oh, fuck no, there is no way... <laughs> I'm not putting Trixie in anything. Um, and he sort of, he looked at me a little bit scared. Um, but he said, okay, okay. And then he showed it to a few friends, and they said, you know, ah, this is really good, you should keep that. And so then after a while, he kind of, he kind of rolled with it, and then he started liking it. Uh, and then he still hired somebody else to do the opening credits. And they screwed it up. Huh, what a shame. Oh. Um, <laughs> And he showed it to me, and I said, Tarsem, please, for the love of God, you have to let me do this, just as a humanitarian type gesture. Um, and um, he said, well, we have, but we have no budget, we have no budget. And I said, that's fine, it's just, this just pains me too much, please. And so he did, in fact, allow me to, uh, to do the credits, uh, to do the opening credits. Um, and... Uh, then I also said, well, listen, I also wanted to do the end credits because it always bugs me when I then see these really horribly typeset end credits. And sometimes you just commit to stuff without really knowing what you're getting into. Uh, and this was one of those cases. So I'm showing you the end credits here, and they're a little sped up, sort of like at the end of a TV show. Um, because all of a sudden you find out that there's a lot of people that work on one of these movies. Um, there's a South Africa unit. You know, and it goes on like that. Um, because for every city, there's a catering guy, there's a production driver, <laughs> and they all want to have their name on screen, and they all have union contracts, and so, you know, as I said, you know, 
oh, you don't have a budget? That's, that's fine. That's sure, I'll do it. I'll type set it because I love type. And you kind of, right around the prog unit is where you sort of start questioning how dedicated you are to the type. Um, you know, but you persevere. Um, and there it is, it rolls to a stately close, the fall, ah. So, let me give you a little close-up of this. Here is the aforementioned prog unit. I wasn't just making an off, like an offhand little joke, no, no. The Prague unit. And uh, you may notice there at the bottom, gaffer Michael McDermott. And one of the things that always bugs me is when people just type stuff in. Listen, if you have a double T, you got to go in and kern that shit. And so, <laughs> if any of you... <laughs> Thank you. So if any of you have the Blu-ray of this, I defy you to stop the credits and freeze frame at any point. Everything is current, everything is nicely tucked in, ligatures. I'm not messing around, <laughs> is all I'm saying. So, from that, I sort of learned, again, if I can have a lot of material, not a lot of great ingredients, then I can cook and I can get my brain to sort of look the other way and just let me do the work. My latest book, which is called The Graphic Eye, um, photographs by graphic designers from around the globe. Uh, because I, first of all, I just love working with photography and I love working with great photography. And I also take a lot of little digital snapshots and that I personally think are pretty damn good. And at the same time, certainly not worth a book of its own. So I thought, you know what? I'm probably not the only one who has that situation. There's probably, every graphic designer has that little folder of kind of pet photos. Um, which turned out to be true. Um, so I gathered a few thousand of those and edited it down to about 500 uh, for this book. This is the US cover, uh, this is the British cover, which I also designed, and that started incidentally with uh, the same round of initial comps, and then it just sort of veered wildly. Uh, Chronicle at one point said, well, you know, we need the type bigger. So I said, you want the type bigger? You got it, pal. Uh, big, stymie. 3D drop shadow. Um, and Chronicle said, God, okay, jeez. Um, but Rotovision said, ooh, fun. So uh, I, I got both the sort of like the big comic book type and the, the sort of the, again, the kind of the modernist special with Avenir. Um, here are a few pages from the book. Uh, and as you can see, people take, you know, many, yellow, very popular this season. Um, and the, the big joy of doing a collection of photographs like that, especially when it's sort of semi-random, is just to find an interesting sequence um, and to, uh, to put the images together in a way that's, that doesn't tell a straight story, but that sort of suggests a little narrative. You know, I mean, obviously, you're the, you know, the sort of poultry corn angle is pretty obvious, and then it goes into just a number of other yellow pages for a while, and sometimes it's the color that connects, and sometimes it's the subject matter. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, cute kitten photos. Um, these are by Brian e. Gomez uh, of the formerly of Speak Up and now of uh, For Print Only and of her many fabulous other books, uh, our own books. And, you know, and I just edited mercilessly and couldn't resist putting little uh, sort of jokes together like, I love you, Big Daddy, the snake tricked me. Um, no. Every once in a while, you gotta go biblical. <laughs> uh, this also, uh, these are also Brownie's photos, and um, this is a little type matrix that you can read any direction. So, provoke thought, puddles, cannibal, uh, wicked united, mutt high, or uh, provoke thought, wicked idea, a quick dump. Um, idea, no hands, no problems. At ease, please, extinct her but misspelled. And they don't necessarily make sense, it's just sort of, you know, it's poetry for those who don't dare write poetry. Uh, and stop resenting your freedoms, which I think is a really good uh, uh, exhortation, certainly. Street scenes from New York. Um, bizarre, bizarre street scenes from New York. And then also, this is actually from the same photographer, uh, from the same designer, um, and I just thought that that was a very nice juxtaposition and a very nice illustration of the male gaze. 
Um, well done. You earn the right to judge, gentlemen. Um, so this is the work that I do for others. But then I also uh, repair permissions occasionally, uh, which is to say that I do, uh, I do things that just... You know, the, the, let me start again. The, the work that you've just seen is to get out of my head, is to take on tasks given to me by others. Uh, what I'm going to show you next is stuff that actually goes back into my head and where I try to take thoughts that pop into my head and actually put them into the world in a usable form. Um, and the first example I'm going to show you is I was invited... So I'm, uh, the, the first is sort of a hybrid. I was invited by the New York Times to do a logo for the Super Bowl, which, you know sort of the big sports event in the U.S. Uh, where all the jocks go absolutely batshit. And um, <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm going to, what am I going to do? Am I going to completely sell out all my values? Am I going to forget all the times that I got beaten up in high school and cater to these people? No. <laughs> That's not how it works. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak to my people and I'm going to come up with the nerdiest possible logo that I can that, again, that caters to the people that in professional sports are the forgotten people, the trampled upon and forgotten. Um, and so here it is. Let me take you through it. Let's start with, you know, you do have your football, your American football, but it is uh, my neighbor Totoro. Because, you know, you got to start off with a little uh, Japan animation, a little anime action, because it's good. Uh, you've got your major uh, three fran uh, sci-fi franchises. You've got Star Trek, Star Wars, and Battlestar Galactica. Um, the football is, of course, USB and Firewire enabled. Uh, you've got a l nice little motto, uh, yay, they, sh they shall wield the pigskin of doom and they shall clash most mightily. Um, you've got uh, the word Super Bowl in Latin, Cyphus Eximus, which actually just means superior bowl. Uh, you've got, uh, I think it was f uh, Super Bowl 43, uh, so I have that here in binary. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a barcode here, a code one, uh, 128 barcode that says 43. And then 43 expressed as a sum, uh, which actually a friend of mine helped me with, who was an honest-to-God rocket scientist. And this was the simplest way he could exp express it. Uh, you've got yourself some Dungeons and Dragons dice. Uh, and I see there are Gygax people in the room very well, good. Uh, and all these also, uh, sp the various fields also always add up to 43, so you've got 43 here, and then all these add up to 43, and then you just have 43 there. Um, you've got some of my own bubbles because branding is important. Um, and then uh, you have Professor Frank from The Simpsons, the sort of patron saint of nerds, wielding the power of the testosterone atom, or molecule, um, which you know, we can only hope that, uh, that uh, Dr. Venter can insert that into algae and make lots of testosterone algae for angry algae. Um, and uh, lastly, because again, it is, you know, you want, oh, wait, lest I forget, uh, Masonic symbol, because you got to get the Freemasons in there because they do rule the world. Um, and then lastly, again, because you want to cater really to the needs of the client, the team logos. The next thing I'll show you is uh, I volunteer with an organization called A26LA. And A26LA uh, is a charity that's, that is part of a national group called A26 Valencia in the United States that sets up tutoring centers for at-need kids in the inner cities of, of big cities. Uh, and it's uh, reading and writing workshops. They get walk-in homework aid, stuff like that. Uh, and this is a fundraising brochure I did for them. This is actually one of the kids. Um, that's just how they show up. 
and what happens is, um, not just randomly, I mean, LA isn't that weird where we just have kids walking around with Viking helmets. The reason that he's got that on is because each one of the tutoring centers has in the front of it uh, a fake store. So New York, for example, has the superhero supply company where you can buy superhero capes and anti-gravity and a can and stuff like that. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a robot store uh, on the East Coast. And then Los Angeles has the Echo Park Time Travel Mart, which is sort of a convenience store supermarket for all your time travel needs. Uh, which they came to me at one point when they were setting that up and they said, would you be interested in designing some products for the Time Travel Mart? And, you know, being of German extrusion, I have the need to conquer and uh, <laughs> decided I'm not going to just, I don't want to do just one product line. I want to do all the product lines and the store and the logo. And, you know, if that's okay with you. Um, <laughs> so they said, sure. Um, they know when to stand, stand back when there's a willing volunteer. So this is the store. Um, and um, as you can see, whenever, uh, whenever you are, we're already then, is the motto of the time travel store. <laughs> and it draws in the kids in there, and I'll show you some of the products. All the products are for sale, and that helps the with the fundraising, um, and then also draws the kids and the parents in so that they know that this is a fun tutoring center, and it's not sort of a dour kind of, you know, I before E kind of thing. Um, one of the, my favorite products is the, um, is the mammoth chunks which is just sort of a mammoth stew. And they come in five pound cans, so they're huge, because it's mammoth. Um, they're rich in essential proteins. The, the directions, oh, and by the way, it is 100% pure woolly mammoth, up to 30% mastodon meat, though. <laughs> um, the, the preparation directions for this are step one, uh, grab can, step two, bang can on counter, step three, howl at the moon. Um, <laughs> because they're caveman directions. Um, and then the, the microwave directions are uh, grab can, bang can against microwave howl. Um, another product for the future is uh, TK brand anti-robot fluid. Warning, does not work on plastic robots. Uh, so all these are just repackaged products, uh, and that's how, that's how we make it work, is that we take, basically the 99 cent store is our main production facility, and then we just have uh, we just print out new labels and, and stick them on and sell a bottle of water for $15 because it's, you know, it, does, uh, it does go towards the programs and it's for the kids. And the pride and joy of the Time Travel Mart is uh, our slushy machine, Time Freezy Hyper Slush. Uh, the flavor that you're not seeing there is Bubonic, pla is, uh, bubonic Blast. Um, and literally, that, that sign is actually not a fake. Five minutes before the opening, it was a working machine, five minutes before the opening, one of the hoses came off with a terrifying bang. Um, and we couldn't serve anything, so the writers that came up, uh, that, that wrote all the copy also then very quickly wrote this sign, and it was so funny, and it sort of encapsulated the very essence of the store so well that we decided the sign is much more important than the actual slushy. So what we're, you know, to this day, that sign is there. Um, I'll talk at this point a little bit about greed control. Because um, <laughs> as, you, as you can see from that, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's some things that I do that, that pay reasonably well and that keep the lights on, but I also do a ton of work. That's just volunteer stuff, just because it's fun. I mean, I don't even necessarily s set out. Uh, I'm, you know, it, it's not that I'm sort of dipped every morning in a vat of goodness. It's just <laughs> that... Um, these things come to me, and when somebody calls you and says, hey, do you want to design a time travel store? Who said no to that? Um, and that happens all the time, and the more I start doing, the more I do that kind of stuff that's really fun for me, the more I get those, um, those opportunities. And I just, I can't bring myself to say no to it, even though it's, it's financially irresponsible. So what I do is I practice greed control, which basically just means uh, I try to keep my overhead as low as possible, which, and it's also one of the reasons why I work by myself. I mean, apart from the fact I'm a weirdo and I don't want to put on pants before four. Um, <laughs> it's, um, you know, I don't want to be responsible for somebody else's livelihood because I just want to be able to take on these, you know, wacky jobs. Um, and, well, let me show you a graph. Um, 
as you can as you can see here, um, as the as your greed increases, the quality of the work goes down. That's just inevitable. And I learned that I started working um, in an ad agency and then a record company, and I saw people that were that came in with the best of intentions, and then just sort of got seduced by all the the trimmings of that lifestyle, and. I, I looked at that, and it was kind of like the, the ghost of Christmas future for me, because I thought, oh, I like nice things. That's going to be awfully tempting uh, to just go, okay, well, you know, I'll do, I'll do some stuff that's just, you know, that's just for me, but then I'll also do some stuff, maybe occasionally, you know, that serves the man, and then the man will pay me, and it'll be great, and then I, I'm going to have a big car, and I'm going to have a, you know, I'm going to go on really excellent vacations and stuff like that. And that's going to be nice. And when you see yourself going down that road, that's that slide. You know, that's this. And that's not to say that you can't get paid well for your work. Of course you can. You can do beautiful, amazing work of, of great integrity um, and still get paid very well for it. But if, that's, if that becomes your primary motivation, if that's how you select the jobs, um, then your qual the quality of your work will suffer because you just pri you're just going to prioritize differently. Um, and that doesn't happen. I don't think anybody sets out to go into, certainly not into design, you know, one of the world's most efficient ways of generating income. Um, I mean, I don't think anybody goes into it like that, like, hey, I'm going to go sell out. I think what happens is you just start getting into a lifestyle of like, oh, I want to do, I want to do nicer things. I want to eat better. I want to do all these things, and then all of a sudden you have more of a, of an overhead to cover, and at that point, you have to somehow service your debt, and I mean especially debt and especially credit card debt. Debt is the new sin. They used like they used to keep you down with, by saying, you know, your God doesn't want you to do what you want to do. That's bad. I'm sorry, I'm going to go a little serious for a second. Well, it'll, it'll pass. Um, but, you know, that's how they used to keep us under control. And that now no longer is quite as effective. And so now the deal is that everybody needs to consume constantly. You have to consume. You have to have a better thing every year. You have to stay with it. And the way that happens is that you borrow money. And as soon as you borrow money, that becomes your driving force. That becomes the first thought you have is before you get to you know, have fun with your work or do anything interesting, you got to make sure that your first consideration is you got to pay the mortgage, you got to pay the rent, you got to make sure that that's all covered. And that's a real impediment to having a free thought. So that's sort of the essence of greed control is to make sure that, for myself at least, the monthly outlay is as small as possible so that I have the maximum amount of freedom. Because I would rather say no to a job that I don't want to do um, than have a big screen TV. Because it's law and order. I mean, how big do you really need it to be? Um, all right, enough of that. Um, one, of the things that I'm able, that one of the things I was able to take on because of that sort of little philosophy, though, is a column that I used to write for Step Magazine called Ink and Circumstance. Um, that let me express some of these, you know, revolutionary, you know, thoughts, uh, but in a way that's also, again, completely nerdy and takes forever and uh, lets me fiddle around. There it is, in fact, greed control. You can see the little graph there. Um, and then uh, some actual actionable advice uh, of how to get a job and um, how to never be lonely is be useful and don't be boring. Um, which is really true. I mean, if you're looking for a job, or if you're, you know, if you're, um, you know, if you feel like you're socially not as integrated into the world as you as you would like, be useful and be lonely is not a bad idea. Um, and just to show you that I didn't just come up with this, my parents recently sent me uh, some homework that I did in 11th grade in high school, and you can see that I never stood a chance. Um, <laughs> this is a chart of world history. Um, and you'll see there that the United States are represented by Scrooge McDuck thinking of a hamburger, which is, as a, you know, when you're growing up as a kid in Germany, that's sort of roughly how you think about it, and it's not that off.
Uh, and then lastly, I'll circle back to the daily monster, which is sort of the very, uh, the very epitome of doing exactly what I want and just taking something that popped into my head and, and spinning it out into something that has now sort of become 80% of my waking hours. Um, and as a matter of fact, if you're not familiar with them, uh, I brought a new monster for you, and let me show you. So each of the monsters starts with a random blot of sumi ink uh, that I put on with a toothbrush now and blow out with a little duster can. And then based on that shape, uh, I create the creatures who tend to have uh, a fondness for pinstripe pants and high-heeled shoes. I have no explanation and no excuse. They're just stylish. And I don't know going in what it's going to look like. I mean, I, it's in none of it's planned. Wow, check out this crowd. Where are we? Dude, we're in South Africa, design in Daba, Cape Town. No kidding. Cool. Yeah, and you're the very first monster to ever go abroad, you know that? Oh, yeah, that's true. You're right which sort of makes you the, the very first ambassador to the whole monster nation. Ambassador, I like it. Hang on. Ah, oh, that's nice. That's very nice. Hey, uh, don't you have a talk to finish? I do, as a matter of fact, yeah. Well, have at it. Bye, everybody. I couldn't, I have to bring you a new monster, come on. And uh, one of the things that grew out of doing the monsters uh, was that I got to do some typographic drawings for an offshoot of Sesame Street called The Electric Company, which was a big show in the 70s and has now been rebooted. So I'll show you some of these as well. The Electric Company is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. So it brings together, you know, the monsters, typography, uh, teaching kids to read, which, you know, a side benefit of that. Um, and I've done, at this point, about 15 of these. Uh, and uh, now my drawings appear next to LL Cool J, which for some reason <laughs> I really like. Um, <laughs> because you don't think that that's going to happen in your life. Uh, <laughs> and, um, well, you know, that, again, is sort of... It's just trying to take things that are in my head and, and getting them out into the world. And I think as designers, that is, that's, sort, that's sort of the job description because as much as we talk about, you know, as designers, we're, we're really business people and we, are, we need a seat at that table and we need to engage in that world. I think that's step two. I think step one is always going to be that we are artists because we see things that other people don't see, or if we see them jointly, we see them certainly in a different light or from a different perspective. And among us individually, I think also we all see them differently, and each of us can only do their very best uh, to, to take the things that, are, that, that come to us 
and whether we understand them or not, give them a shape that can live independently of us. Um, because nobody will care about those. Nobody else gets the ideas that we get. Nobody else can understand them unless we translate them for the rest of the world. And nobody will care about them as much as we do. And so I think it's our responsibility to give them that shape. When you look back, when you go to the museums, you're not going to go to an exhibit of you know, Sumerian accounting practices. Uh, you're going to go to see art and poetry and, your, and the music and things like that are what endures because that's what is kind of, is, those are the artifacts and those are the things that explain what it meant to be human at that point and what we're creating now, especially for, for uh, graphic design and for, and for uh, architecture and for product design, um, those are going to be the artifacts that are going to tell people down the road what it was like to be human now. And so I think that what we have to contribute to society is far from trivial, and it can be, and it should certainly, you know, and, and certainly it's fun, but at the same time, it also, I, I do think that it serves a real lasting purpose. And so I think our job is to just get as good as we possibly can at, at the instruments and at the, at the ways of making these things real um, as we can so that the ideas that we have and, the, and the, the point of view that we get about the world, that we have the skills to translate that into something commonly understandable as best as we can and with a, as little loss between the thought and the execution. And so that's cer it's certainly what I see as my mission, and it's certainly, what I see, it's certainly the thing that keeps me up at night and keeps me going back and back and back to the pieces. And my contribution right now happens to just be the monsters. And sometimes you have to just do what's most dear to you and what's most fun, and then just try to do it as I hope to do, as I hope I'm doing, with the utmost energy that I can bring to it, because you know, no matter how tired I feel or no matter how exhausted I may be at some point, that's going to go away. That's not going to matter a week from now or a month from now or a year from now or whenever. The only thing ultimately that matters is, is what you leave on the paper. And so right now for me that's that. And I'm going to do two new books that are completely different and I'm going to pour as much of myself into those as I can. And it almost doesn't matter what you do. And I don't, I'm not saying, you know, go out and work by yourself or something. I don't care how you do it. The point of it all is to just understand your operating system and understand how your head works and set up for yourself um, a life that lets you do the thing that you love to do as hard as you can, as often as you can, and with as much joy as you possibly can. Um, and then that's all there is to it. And that's really all I have for you today. So thank you very much. <laughs>